touch of charm and beauty and the good things of life as Southern California. From the beautifully designed Spanish-type station at Los Angeles, in the heart of the City of the Angels, the thrill of Southern California is in the air. In the years since the turn of the century, Los Angeles has grown from a sleepy pueblo to a vast, seething metropolitan city. It is almost unnecessary to say that among the chief attractions of the Southern California picture is its many miles of beaches where you can be as athletic as you choose or just loll around and build up a beautiful tan. When did music first start uh, coming into your life? Was it something that was there right from the very start? Music has been uh, my life. I, I was exposed to music. As a matter of fact, the first song, it's very funny, the very first really song I was, was exposed to was Rhapsody in Blue which I, there's no better way to come into this world than through Rhapsody in Blue than to hear uh, a song like that being played. And uh, what is there about, what is the, you know, like an early recollection of hearing Rhapsody in Blue? Oh yeah, when I hear Rhapsody in Blue, I'm certain every time I hear it that I'm going back to age two. From, from age, well actually two, when I was two weeks old, they used to play Rhapsody in Blue at my grandmother's house where my mother used to go visit a lot. And uh, so the Rhapsody in Blue has become kind of one of the songs of my life. It sort of became a, general life theme and uh, yeah music has been uh, my life I've been exposed to it. my father was a songwriter before I was born he was writing songs and uh, right around the time I was born he would sing to me my mother would play the organ and my dad would sing and they do duets organ and piano and so as far back as I can remember there's been music in my life my name is Brian Wilson I'm the leader and uh, I sing the high voice in the Beach Boys and uh, which instrument do you play I play the bass and your age I'm 22. My name is Mike. I'm 23, and I've seen the uh, the lead part on the fast songs and bass and the slow songs. And once in a while, I play the saxophone. My name is Al Jardine. I play the rhythm guitar, and I sing in the background with Carl. My name is Dennis Wilson. I'm 20 years old. I play the drums. And you got beetle hair? No, I don't have beetle hair. It's your own hair. It's my own hair. <laughs> my name's Carl Wilson, and I play lead guitar and sing background with Al, and I'm 17. <laughs> Tutti Frutti in uh, Manrique's backyard, who are neighbors down the street. And I was, I think, maybe seven or eight years old, and I remember this incredible feeling of, of uh, this excitement in my body. <laughs> and, and it was just a real emotional experience. I didn't really know what it was that was going on. I was just kind of came on to this real heightened awareness type of thing, which just really, uh, really blew my mind. My mom, uh, being a uh, sister of, of their dad, Marie Wilson, they being my first cousins, therefore, uh, my mom was very much into music. So there was always music on, uh, you know, birthday celebrations, Thanksgiving, Christmas holidays. We would get together, for instance, and, and do, uh, what do you call it, Christmas caroling around yeah. the neighborhood. And so after that, the kids would peel off in one direction, the younger ones would do what they're going to do, and the teens, like uh, Brian and myself and my sister Maureen, they, we, we would get together and we would we would uh, get somebody to sing a fourth bar and we'd do some harmonies. Yeah. So that was, that was, it was just always music growing up. Brian, I'd like to go back into your personal background a little bit and talk about a place that you hung out in your teenage years. 
a place called Lashan's Record Shop on Imperial Highway in Hawthorne, California, where the time spent there became a pivotal involvement in terms of your career. It was a, uh, a record store. It wasn't a real big record store, but it had one uh, record booth where you could go in and shut the door, and there was a window on the door so you could see out, you know. And uh, people were allowed to take demonstration records and take them in there and play them, and, if, and then if they liked them, they could, they'd buy them, you know. But, but it really stimulated, stimulated a lot of business, you know what I mean? So I went there, and I, I can't remember who I played. I, I know I sampled something. I can't remember just what, what it was. Four freshmen, maybe? Maybe the freshman. I think it might have been the freshman, the four freshmen, yeah. It was a, uh, an attempt on my part to try to relate to music, you know what I mean? And, like, the only way I could relate to it was by immersing myself in the music. At first, I thought I might have been a little scared of the four freshmen, only because they were very awesome and their harmonies were beautiful. I think I have something here with this group, the four freshmen. I thought to myself, as a matter of fact, I know I have some, I'm on to something here with this group, you know. We remember always graduation from their harmonies, I would I would dissect every note of their harmonies and, 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 and transpose it over to my piano so that I could play each one of those songs from start to finish, absolutely to the exact note. Right. You know what I mean? The arrangements I could copy. I learned, in other words, I discovered at, at an early, at age 14, that I could actually dissect modern harmony. What happened was I learned to concentrate on music that way so that when the Beach Boys happened, uh, developed in my life, I had the knack of making harmonies. We used to sing a lot as a family. And then when Brian started to develop as a you know, composer and a music arranger also, we uh, would sing his arrangements. And I remember it was my mom making me sing. Brian would say, Mom, make Carl sing. And I was really young, about eight or nine years old, something like that. So we just always, there was a lot of music in the house all the time. Surfing was Dennis's idea. Dennis uh, was a surfer. And so he wanted Brian to write a song about going to the beach. And it was really his, that was really Dennis's baby, the idea of making music about surfing, going to the beach and cars and, you know, just what it was like to hang out. And first I remember of the group starting was that uh, Dennis went to the beach with Michael Love, our cousin, and uh, when they came back, the buzz around the house became, well, we're going to have, we're going to get a group together and, and sing about going to the beach and stuff. The very first, 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 first rehearsals uh, were, I think, when we were, we were trying to uh, learn how to perform, <laughs> meaning we, our first song that we ever recorded was called Surfin', and uh, that was in the fall of 1961, and at that time, Carl Wilson was the only person who could play a guitar. He's our lead guitarist, and he played guitar. Brian played the piano, but on the record, he played just the snare drum. One little drum, snare drum, just hit that, and uh, Al, Al Jardine, who played guitar as well, he played a stand-up bass, what they call stand-up bass, the big actual bass instrument you see in orchestras, you know. And so there's bass, guitar, drum, singular, <laughs> one, <laughs> and then we just sang, sang the song uh, with that as the backing. And so when we uh, asked to perform in Southern California at fraternity parties or graduation nights and parties and, and so on, and uh, high school assemblies, um, they um, the necessitated our getting together and learning how to actually perform instruments. So I, I played the saxophone a little bit, uh, and um, so Al then played rhythm guitar, Carl Lee played lead guitar, Bert, Brian took up and learned the bass, and Dennis learned the drums. Before that, they'd never played bass and drums, so um, that was it. So the first uh, rehearsals were kind of funny. It was kind of everybody getting used to playing together. I don't think we were thinking that 
clearly about it. We just knew that we liked music and we liked singing, and particularly making doing the harmonies, and uh, that there was this thing going on in Southern California, peculiar to that region, called surfing. And there was a whole lifestyle and way of dressing and even a, a vocabulary that developed. And, uh, and so we being among those who identified ourselves uh, in, in that manner, uh, we told this record producer who originally wanted us to do a folk song. We said, oh, we like the King's Trio and Peter Paul and Mary OK, but we're not really folkies. We like rock and roll and R&B. So we came back just uh, a week or so later with, with surfing and and recorded it, and within a month or so, it was on the radio, and it was quite successful in, in Southern California. Surfing is the only life, the only way for me now. Surf, surf with me. I got up this morning, turned on my radio. I was checking out the surfing scene to see if I would go. And when the DJ tells me that the surfing is fine, that's when I'm Hey everybody, welcome to my brand new deep dive series by popular request. I'm starting a new one. This is going to be a Beach Boys deep dive series. I'm going to be talking about their 1960s album. And today I'm going to be starting with their debut album, Surf and Safari. Surf and Safari was released on October 1st, 1962, and was made possible by the success of their second single, Surf and Safari, which reached number 14 on the U.S. Billboard chart. sixties, it was very much a singles oriented market. Albums were seen as almost like a cash cow, a way to take advantage of a couple of hit singles and pad out the rest of the album with a lot of filler songs and substantial tracks. Bands were sent into the studio to record a bunch of essentially insubstantial tracks to give the record company enough material to release a full-length album. And that's basically what you have with Surf and Safari. You've got the number 14 single Surf and Safari on here. You've got 409, which would also be a single. You've got their first single Surfing on here. And then the rest of it is really not much to write home about. They're not very memorable. They're passable. They're not terrible songs, but in terms of what the Beach Boys would go on to do, you can tell it's their first album. A lot of the songs are taken at the same tempo. You can tell their skills as musicians are not quite what they would be. So as a first album, not the greatest, not necessarily the worst, but this was one of the key albums that defined the California surf sound back in the day. So on side one, you've got Surf and Safari, which still today 
sounds like a great record. And there's a reason it went all the way to number 14. It's a solid, solid composition. Next, we have County Fair, which has one of the most annoying Mike Love vocals ever. If you're not a fan of Mike Love's vocals, this one in particular will just be grating on the ears. It's extremely nasally. It's got a pedestrian Dennis Wilson beat. Not really a whole lot to recommend. It's your average fair par for the course for this album basically nothing extremely exciting here not really much in the way of flashes of the brian wilson genius he did he was responsible for arranging all of the songs he did not get producers credit nick vinay actually got the producer's credit for the album, although it was really Brian Wilson working with his father, Murray Wilson, who was also managing the band, to come up with these arrangements and the way that he wanted them to sound. And you got 10 Little Indians, which sounds like a nursery rhyme that they basically set to a rock and roll beat. Nothing special there. Chug a Log, a song about drinking root beer. There's such an innocence to a lot of these songs. It's almost, I'm sure now, it's a little bit embarrassing to them, the material that they came up with on this first album. But they were so young back in the day, and they were trying to write songs that teenagers could relate to. Standing around the soda fountain, drinking root beer, going to the drive-in. You know, all the things that teenagers back then would relate to. Then Little Miss America, which is a cover of a Herb Alpert composition, is okay. Sort of got like a doo-wop flavor to it. And then 409, which is another one of those songs that pops up on most Beach Boys compilations today. One of their first car songs. A friend of Brian Wilson's, Gary Usher, co-wrote a few of these songs with Brian Wilson. Not the first time that they would collaborate. Gary Usher knew more about the inner workings and mechanics of cars. And so, mostly on the car tracks, Gary Usher would get a co-songwriting credit. Side 2 opens up with Surfing, their debut single, which... Sounds better than most of the songs on this album, even though it was the first song that they released. Then you've got Head You Win, Tales I Lose. Again, another pedestrian rocker with trite lyrics that contain some teenager lingo. Then you have a cover of Johnny Cochran's Summertime Blues. A clumsy cover. It's okay. It's got a little bit of a surf flavor to it, but... Certainly not an improvement on the original, but it's passable. You understand why it's on here with the theme of summertime. Then you got Cuckoo Clock, again, with just a very uh, weak lyrics, and the arrangement sounds pretty much cookie cutter to a lot of the other tracks on here. Moondog is a very enjoyable surf instrumental. It's got some howling of a dog. Um which maybe Pink Floyd would borrow for their song Seamus. But, you know, as an instrumental, surf instrumental goes, I mean, they're no Dick Dale, they're not the Ventures, but they don't embarrass themselves here. I find it an enjoyable enough song. <laughs> Closes out the album. Sounds like 75% of the other songs on here. Again, taken at the same Dennis Wilson rudimentary drum tempo. Nothing exciting here either. I don't hate this album, but it's not one that I play very often. The only really memorable songs on here for my money are Surf and Safari, 409, uh, Moon Dog and surfing. That's about it. The rest of it is okay. I mean, the best was yet to come. Uh, but this album, you know, if you're a collector, if you're a Beach Boys fan, you know, certainly pick it up. This is my mono copy. This is my stereo copy with that nice blue capital stereo banner. 
on the Capitol label. And then I got a 70s repress here, which cover looks very much like the mono, but for whatever reason, they didn't replicate the photographs, uh, which were on the original release. Not sure why, but these 70s budget releases suck. So anyway, that is the Surfing Safari album. Uh, next time we're going to be talking about their second album, which was slightly better. That one's called Surfing USA. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. Let me know what you think about the debut album.